This is the Kevin Simpson Show, expert insight and analysis from the industry's top investment professionals. If you'd like a deeper understanding of today's markets, this is the show for you. Thanks for tuning in to the Kevin Simpson Show. We're so lucky today to have one of the most successful commodity traders ever to join us, Mr. Mark Fisher. Mark is the founder and CEO of MBF Clearing Corporations. He is a true legend on Wall Street, and he is by far, hands down, the most successful trader uh, that's ever graced this podcast. So, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. No problem, Kevin. How are you? I'm great, thank you. And I, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to take you back to the beginning because, I mean, your story is just incredible. Uh, you, you think about it, you started as a floor runner at age 12. And when I was 12, Mark, I was like trying to put together a treehouse, like not right. very well. And, uh, and somehow you're, you're sitting on the floor of the comics. How, how did you make something happen like that at that age? How did you take an opportunity and turn that into something real? Well, you know, it, it's, it's a matter of being in the right place at the right time. A lot of it, you know, you, you make your luck or you, you get lucky, whatever. So I lived in the neighborhood in Long Island and I went to a, a, a private school and I was completely, uh, how should I say, it's hyperactive. And, but I was pretty intelligent because I, you know, so they were happy for me not to be in school as long as I did well on every test. That's, that's putting it mildly. So what happened was my neighbor down the block, I kept seeing him coming home with nicer, nicer cars. And I said, all right, I got to figure this out. So I go to his house and I ask him, what does he do for a living? And he, and he says to me, what do you care what I do for a living? You know, you, how old are you? I said, I'm 13, 12, 13. He shuts the door. Lucky for me, his son, who was a friend of mine, his middle son, how should I say, was a very good athlete, but academically challenged. So I went back a week later, so banged on his door again. He's about to shut the door on my face again. I said, wait, wait, don't shut the door. I have a business proposition. He goes, you have a business proposition for me? I go, yeah. He goes, what is it? I said, transfer your son to my school. I'll tutor him. He'll get through every subject, I promise you, by hook or by crook. And let's just say, by, by, not by hook, not by crook. And he says, well, what do you want? I said, well, I want to come work with you. He says, you're 13, 12, 13 years old. What do you mean, what are you going to come work? He says, do you even know what I do? I said, it doesn't matter. I just want to figure it out. He says, well, how do you not be able to go to school? I said, trust me, school doesn't care as long as I get 100 in every exam. I have a you know, semi-photographic memory. I just create guys. They're happy for me not to be there Monday and Fridays. So he said, okay. So the first day, uh, he took me down to the old floor of the Commodities Exchange, where they were still writing in chalk on the blackboards. I love it. And that's how I got started. And when I was 14, it was the day after Thanksgiving, and not many people know this, and um, it was the day after Thanksgiving, and there was a snowstorm. There weren't many people there. And he says to me, okay, uh, he goes, you see those three phones on the wall? If they ring, come get me. Okay. So phone rings. There's no, you know, it's half the people on there. It's a snowstorm. Silver was at that point lock limit down, which means it was the most it could be down in a day. And the phone rings, and I go in the pit, and I get him, and I go to the phone ring. He says, okay, answer the phone. He goes, you want me to answer the phone? He goes, yeah. If the guy on the other end of the phone knows you're 14, if you sound like an idiot, right? And one other thing, which I won't say, because this is a- this is It's a, a family show. This is a family show. He goes, you're fired. I go, I didn't even start. So I pick up the phone, and I, I say the name of the company, and the guy on the phone says, who am I talking to? I said, Mark. He goes to me, how come I never heard your voice before? And I said, well, usually I'm in gold on the London, New York gold line. I made something up. And he goes, okay. With, you know, how much lower silver? I said, it's locked on the down. He goes, how many, low, how many, how many uh, contracts on the, on the down pull? I find out. And then he says to me, and I'm 14 years old. Oh, 13, 14, I don't know, 13, 14. He says to me, he goes to me, well, what do you think of the market? Now, this guy is asking me what I think of the market. I said, listen, there's nobody here. <laughs> I have to be clear. You know, one big order, the market go anywhere. He goes, Okay. So he says, clock a ticket. So now the, broker, the clerks are laughing at me, and I clock this ticket, which is an order, and he gives me this order, which is a ridiculous order, huge. And I take the order, and I go into the pit, and I hand it to um, you know, my boss, and he looks at me and goes, you're fired. I go, yeah, I'm fired. Yeah, it's giving you. He goes to me, no one, this is, you, do you know how much this is? This is crazy now. And he goes back to the phone, and it was a real order, and it was, I won't tell you which one it was, but you know when the hunch tried to corner, corner the silver market? Of course. The, right. It was all involved in that time with a 
a professional trader who was one of the people who was semi, very heavily involved. And the order was to buy the position limit in Meso, which would be the equivalent for your viewers of someone giving an order to buy, I don't even know, 30 million shares of IBM at the market. Right. And they gave it to a 14 year old. And that's how I got started. You're like Jesse Livermore. Right. It was crazy. And then I was 17 and I was, I was going to go to Brown Six Year Med School. And I said, what am I doing? I'm not going to Brown Six Year Med School. So I had gotten accepted to Wharton School of Business, University of Pennsylvania. So I went there and I was 18 and I wanted to start trading because I was ready on the floor. I knew, I mean, it was crazy what was going on. Nobody, nobody, if I only knew now what I knew back then, I would be, I'd have a lot more money. Anyway, so I go to my, my parents and I said, listen, I need someone to open an account at a, at a brokerage firm because I'm only 18 and I can't do it. I'm going to put all the money I have made, which was a tremendous amount of money at that time, in the account. I want you to match the account. And whatever I make for myself, I keep. And whatever I make for my parents, you, I take half. Like, you know, like a fund manager, right? Yeah. My father was in the supermarket business. I'll never forget this. My father said to me, Mark, I'm the supermarket business. I see the money coming in dimes and quarters. I'm not letting you, you know, gamble my money in thousands of dollars. And Dad, this is not gambling. I, I see the entire book. Think about being the, like the, the biggest specialist in the most volatile commodity at the age of eight. It was crazy. So he says, no. So I go, what am I going to do? So I went to my grandfather and he said, you know, Mark, um, you know, he said, Mark, you know, you're my favorite, but this is just too risky. So I said, you know, grandpa, dad said the same thing. And he said to me, your father said the same thing. And he said, blanket, open the account. So that's what we did. So freshman year, while people are walking around with that 10 cents in their pockets, and that's what I was too. Between freshman year and the first year of sophomore in college, we made $2.2 million, and that's how I got started. At that point, I wanted, to, I, I wanted to go to school, but I also wanted to trade. So I wanted to trade when I was 21, but I also wanted to have a backup plan, which most people don't have. What happens if trading doesn't work out? So I convinced a friend of mine, who was also pretty intelligent, and her and I were accepted into the five-year sub matriculation program, which is where you get your MBA in five years, three years undergrad, two years grad, and they take like 10 kids a year. And since I had had a good, uh, very good um, academic profile, and I was crazy, as you can tell, both her and I got accepted. And I promised her that I would pay for her college education. I would get her a job working for me after college. And I graduated summer cum laude undergrad and grad, wrote my thesis paper on a trading model, which we still kind of use. And that's, and that's how I got started. When you, were, when you were 21 and you were in the silver pits, what was that like? It was, you know, chaos. But, you know, the difference between being in the silver pit at 21 and everyone else who was trading is I had like a, I had created my thesis paper on a methodology of trading. Most people were just reacting, which is what 90% of people do. But when you had a method to create, it gave you more confidence. And confidence, as you know, in any type of, in type of investing, if you feel like you have an edge, you kind of have an edge. It's when you don't have a game plan is when you're an investor or a trader when you run into trouble. If you don't know where you're getting out, if you're wrong, which is what the whole thing is about, then you shouldn't be, then it's very hard to trade or invest because you have no idea where to get out if you're wrong. You have no idea how to measure risk reward. So the good thing about what I had done was I created a system where I could know exactly where I was getting out if something was, you know, was going against me. So, and as long as I was disciplined enough to follow that, it, you know, it kind of helped me out. Do you still do you still teach your traders now the ACD method? Is this the, oh, well, is the, ACD, the, ACD, is this the ACD, same thing we're talking about, or is this a, a well, the, ACD, the ACD method that I wrote a book on it's in years ago has evolved. So I would say that's like a book, like a, that's like a, that's like an elementary school book. But now, like the college level or the the doctor level is a lot more complicated, but all based on those same principles. And we don't we we don't you know we don't take as many trades as we used to. You know, I, I have my, you know, I have my core group of kid, uh, people that have been with me forever, like 25, 30 traders. You know, I take a couple of year. I, you know, my son runs a group who's 33. My stepson who's 16, who goes to school down in Miami. I corrupted him at the age of 12. So he'll be trading by the time, while he goes to school, hopefully at Penn, but, maybe, but he'll be trading. I got my six year old who knows how to play poker with me online. And he played with me during COVID on, in the, all the online tournaments. And I would even let him play some of the hands 
which were insane by himself at five, and he knows how to play, because this is all about expected value, risk reward, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as you can tell, you know, this is, I, I'm not, this is not a normal environment, but we make it work. It's, it sounds like a good bloodline, smart genes. Okay. Well, smart or crazy or both. Oh, I can respect that. How about from a risk management standpoint? How important is risk management in every you trade? See, it, you see, the, the thing is, risk management is everything. And if you don't have risk management, it doesn't. You, there's no way. There's no way that you can trade or do anything. If you and I were going to open up, I don't know, a pizza store, and you know I was this, and I said, Kevin, give me three hundred thousand dollars because I, you know, I'm going to open up this pizza store in Miami. You know, the first question you should ask me is, well, how much can I lose, and what's the probability of me losing, and before everything else. But that's not the way the world works today. The world works is well, how much can I make, right? In my mind, the making takes care of itself, where people run into trouble is not being able to define their risk. And luckily for me, everything we do is, is define risk. You know, what I do though, just as you know, to your viewers out here, is like, no, when you do this and you're so disciplined, you're gonna get stopped out and stopped down lows. And it's it's a very humbling, humiliating process when you know you're always gonna, you know where you're getting out if you're wrong, and you have to follow it. So you know. Once in a blue moon, my wife and I, we go to the casino, we go to Vegas, wherever it may be. Because there, it's like, to me, legalized drugs. I can take X amount of money and do everything that I don't do at work. So I did any of that stuff at work, I'd be broke. And to, your, to people watching this podcast, it's all about, can you go ahead and create defined points of risk where, what, what are you risking? What's the expected value? What can I make? Why do I think I can, I can make it? What's my, you know, what's my, what's my edge in the trade? What's my age in investment? And that's it. I mean, I think that's the most important thing anybody who's listening can learn from, because most of our viewers are financial advisors, retail clients. They don't live in the commodity world, but even in equities, risk is so important. We're thinking like, how much can we make exactly what you're saying? It's so easy to buy something. It's fun and awesome to buy. But having a sell discipline, whether it's to the upside or downside, is really, really difficult for most people. So if you take the emotion out of it like you do, I mean, that's a lesson that we can translate into our world very easily. You know what happens to a lot of people also when I find, whether, and we, again, we, you know, the futures market and the crypto markets trade like, you know, it, it's like equities on steroids, although there's some equities that trade, you know, crazy too. So if you can define the risk and, and define it well, you know, people say, well, how do you know when to get out of something if, if it's going up? Well, if I talk to, let's say, my community of, of peers, and I say, why is this going up? And they say they have no idea. It's usually going up a lot more. But when, when someone calls me up and says, blah, blah, blah is up because of this, when they kind of think why it's going up, it's, even if it's going to go up anymore, it's time to, it's time to hit the button and sell half the position. Right? Because whenever you think you know what's going to happen, then you figure it out, that's, that's time to get out of here. Are you trading crypto? We trade everything. We trade, as long as we trade power, not gas, Every commodity, mostly energy, but we trade the grains, we trade cattle, we trade hogs, we trade sugar, we trade cotton, we trade, you know, natural gas is obviously what we spend a lot of our time in. Um, we trade, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana. I got people, trade. as long as it moves, where we lose money is when something doesn't move. Because you know, because we're not volatility traders, but we need the juice in order to make it go. We, we're not call sellers. We're not going to go ahead and sell straddles. We're not going to go ahead and say, let's collect income. You know, we go for, you know, we look for asymmetric opportunities like in the power market last year, when power went from $70 in, in a week and a half to 9,000, right? Right, in our cut power. We have meteorologists that work first full time. We try to create an edge. Again, we're, we're wrong. I would say almost as much as we're right. Well, if you're wrong and you lose, you know, this and you're right and you can make this over time you're becoming the house yeah hopefully are you hoping for a cold winter you see that we're hoping for a cold winter only because it'll give us more opportunities you know again hoping is a bad word in investing right you know you gotta look for points where i'm gonna risk x to make y i mean i think that the, the country as a whole has no idea what's about to come to it with you know in terms of energy i think that the green revolution that's going to take place in the next 10 to 15, 20 years in this country, people think they're going to snap their fingers and it's going to be here tomorrow. So if you and I own, you know, you know, dirty fuel, coal, oil, 
that gas from Madrid. And we're going to go ahead and you're going to say, okay, we're going to carbon tax you. We're going to, we're going to disincentivize you from producing. And we don't, you know, and we don't replace our, you know, spend money on capex to replace our reserves. And if you, and if the carbon and the, if the, if the clean energy wind solar is not ready to take over, it doesn't have, it doesn't have it. And it's not, not just re- renewable, but reliable in terms of this. You know, if we're not, that disconnect is going to create a period of time when, where the old energy is going to go through the roof. I mean, that's why, you know, natural gas at $5 this year when it goes to $5, it's right. Sometime in the next couple of years, it's going to go to $15, $20 in this country. It's already $30 overseas. At some point, crude oil, which is $80, right? It could go down to 75 They release the SPR. They don't release the SPR. But if, if you don't have enough, you know, reserves in your tank and you don't have, and you're not ready to go to clean energy, the price of oil is going to go to 150 200 It has to, because the only way to get demand destruction is to price everybody out. How long would it take? I mean, I'm not totally convinced that you can go from where we are today to this clean, renewable energy in, in 10 or 15 years. I mean, sometimes I'm thinking this could be a 50-year endeavor. Is that crazy? I, I don't see the thing is, I, I know what I know. I don't know. I don't know. I know what I don't know. And to be to be frank with you, well, like once every three, four months, I go on your know, CBC one of those shows, and they always try to ask you questions to pin you down. And they get frustrated with me because a lot of times I say, I have no idea. Right? So do I know it's going to take 15 years? I have no idea if it's going to take 15 or 50. I can tell you it's not it taking three. Right. right. That's all I know. I don't know. If, you know, I'm, I'm not in that space. I don't know if it's taking 15, 10, hike, 50. All I know is it's not happening in the next three years. And if you're going to, if the world's going to, you know, create this situation where we're going to disincentivize people from producing in this country at the same time while not while Africa in order to expand their quality of living needs more dirty you know energy while China and India are not going to be coming back relatively right where Russia has this pipeline that they're using as you know energy blackmail or they're at least trying to although I don't even know if they really have the energy that they actually say they have to produce whatever it may be you know in, a, in an environment where oil and gas accounts for three or four percent of the entire overall capitalization of the stock market. Okay. This is this is a freight train, you know, looking to happen. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with what happened with ERCOT power in February in Texas, but that's a perfect example. The, the, the country, you know, Texas was going to rely on renewables to, you know, wind and solar to go ahead and make up, you know, you know, for um, for the for the electricity that was, you know, from the turbines. And then when 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 the cold weather happened, and they were not um, winterized, right? When the weather happened and you had this freak storm, power went from seventy dollars to nine thousand on a cap, and people got blown out of the water. You know, that was. I, think there, was, I think there was also people who didn't have power for a, quite some time. Yeah, and and, people, and, and, the, and the utilities people went ahead to save you know ten fifty percent of their bills. They went to these companies that guaranteed them a flat price, you know, in return for. Um, you know, paying a little more, but they didn't realize that those companies were not to hedge them, and they couldn't. And when the when the cogen plants all struck down, they couldn't even. They couldn't. They, they all went broke. This is. I mean, in the UK, three weeks ago, I had friends of mine that were sitting on lines to, to get gas in their car. Power in the UK cost thirty two dollars the equivalent of natural gas here, and we're and we're complaining about six dollar natural gas. You know, to some degree, we're all spoiled. You know, it, it's part of the whole, what I call the entitlement, you know, era we live in. Yeah, that's more than some degree. Can yeah. you trade power? Yeah, you can trade power on futures on the market, you know, on the on the intercontinental exchange. You can trade it on the CME. It's thin, and it's a, and, it, and I would not recommend it to anybody who on your platform. But yes, you can trade it. Talk to me about the difference between trading in the pits and doing everything online and remotely. I was thinking, I took my son to the New York Stock Exchange maybe a year before COVID, and it was like an amazing museum, beautiful right. and, and functioning. Yeah, but I also yeah. I also took him to the Indianapolis 500 Raceway that same year on non-race day. And right. it was very reminiscent of like this awesome mausoleum. But, you know, if you're not there when the race is going on, it's not quite as exciting. Is but there an advantage what? or disadvantage now? No, you know what it is? A lot of people on the floor got spoiled because it was a huge advantage to see the bid offer spread on the floor. And they didn't make the transaction off the floor. But when you made the transition off the floor, you had to be one of two things. You had to be a quant who can go ahead and and, and um, 
and and do all the regression studies and all the and know your math so that you can just you know you know learn how to do it. Or you had to be what we were. And what we were was we always spent money to learn electronic trading. But in terms of that, what you really need to do is there's four steps in the decision making process: accumulate data, analyze, decide, implement. And whether you're on the trading floor, whether you're trading on a screen, whether you're the race car driver at the Indianapolis 500, right? Those are the four steps, accumulate, analyze, decide, implement. And the faster and the better you are at it, and the more you can help, the quicker you can do it, and the more input you can take into your mind. So like, if you could be a point guard and you could see the entire field and react to 30 things at once, as opposed to just being, you know, we have blinkers on and do one, the better you can trade as long as you have discipline. You know, one of the traders that we had from a long time ago, I hired two traders, like, I remember this is a while ago. And one of the traders is a street kid, very smart in math. And I met him because of my little kids, he was, he was an ice cream truck driver during the summer, you know, when I was in college. And I would see 50 kids go to his truck at the same time and all ask bark orders to them. And he'd be able to handle the whole thing. You order this, this, and this, you order this, this, and this, you order this, and this, you order $2, $3, $4, height, they can handle it. At the same time, I was introduced by my ex-brother-in-law to, to someone who went to Harvard Law School. Super genius, right? Super thorough, whatever it may be. And I hired him. Well, I could tell you, which kid do you think made $40 million and which person was, was, was out of the business in a year and a half? The ice cream truck vendor went on to make $40 million, and the and the Harvard-trained person ended up becoming a, uh, a I think, a, um, a M&A lawyer you know, down the road. Something to be said for street smarts. Yeah. Something to be said for being organized, managing your time, knowing how to evaluate risk, and the four steps. At, accumulate, analyze, decide, implement. I love it. We, um, we learned a lot about your background and, and the charitable endeavors that you're involved with. You know, it is successful and incredible as you've been in the professional trading world. It, it seems like you've been a, as uh, giving you know, as involved with uh, with the charities, both in New York and which you're starting now in, in South Florida. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you got involved with that? Well, what, see, what, really simple. Well, a couple of my friends currently own NBA and NFL teams. And like, if you can't own those teams and you don't want to own those teams, and it's, it's something, even if you could, helping kids out, right, and helping them realize their dreams, especially kids that come from less fortunate backgrounds, is what it's all about. I'm not going to win all my kids are healthy, you know, they've all been spoiled by me to some degree. They'll tell you they weren't spoiled. I'll tell you they were spoiled. It doesn't matter. But the point being is you need to give back. And to me, I was saying, okay, how can I give back in a way that it, it, and create the most value? So what we did was, uh, this is, let's see, my son said, yeah, when he was like, I don't know, it must be 20-something years ago, you know, there was a program in Long Island that was a basketball program that ran into trouble financially. And we took it over. And we've been running it for the past 20 years. Where I basically, I don't run it. I basically, you know, help manage it. And I, I'm the quote unquote money guy behind it, for lack of a better word. And over the years, that program has flourished. And they've gotten them over about, I think we've gotten over like 550 kids, partial full division one scholarships. We have kids in the NBA now. We have kids that go to, let's say, you know, the Ivy League Rookie of the Year came from our program last year. The Big East Rookie of the Year came from our program. You know, we have kids that have gone to Harvard, kids that have gone to Stanford, kids that have gone, you know, just to St. John's. I don't mean St. John's in a bad way, but I, my idea is to how many kids we can help and what's our return on investment, how many college scholarships we can get. And it's, it's a rewarding experience because when you help kids and you don't want something back in return, you're not an agent and you're not in their head and you're not really telling them what to do, it's, it's a great experience. You know, I have uh, one of our players who was in the NBA uh, a couple of years ago, he came into town with this team that was from the West Coast. And I got a phone call, 911 on my phone from the person who, ran up, who runs our place in Long Island back then. And he said, blah, 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 just showed up with the entire Sacramento King team. <laughs> and, he went ahead and he took over the, all the courts. And there's like 300 kids here playing 300 on 15 on all three courts with the kids. He brought out the entire snack bar for whatever, gave away every single thing in the snack bar. We're seeing the kids and telling them, you know, about 
the value of your working hard and doing the best you could and, and not doing any drugs. And he's telling them stories about you. And that, that, that makes you feel good. You know, it's a, it's a way of giving back. You know, we're not going ahead and sitting there in a meeting and raising, you know, bureaucracies don't work for me. Don't, maybe they work for some of you viewers, but this is a way of doing this in a way that you're helping kids is the best way to feel good about yourself, in my opinion. And you started this in South Florida also? We started in South Florida and we've had a couple of problems, issues with the South Florida program, but we're getting through them. But we had a, we had a program in the, in the recent past, we had a student coming from an area which is the equivalent of a really bad area with great parents who was supposed to go to, let's say, a mid-level non-academic school, but to play basketball in four wide. And instead, with our help, he is now a sophomore. And he's in the, he's in the, you know, the starting seven rotation for the school. And he's the first kid that I know from that area. I mean, I'm talking about a really bad, poor area. And he goes to Notre Dame. That's awesome. Right. So that's what it's all about for me, you know, what you can do. It's full circle. You know, it's coming yeah. up the way you did with just an incredible moxie. You know, who has the balls to knock on the door of a trader at 12 and 13 and say, right. give me a job. Right. And I also don't believe, I, I think you might have fibbed a little bit about the Vegas trip. I mean, if I'm a Vegas casino, I'm not letting you sit at my uh, blackjack table. Not with that savant mind. No, no. The problem is, again, when I, when I play the poker tournament, I've played these poker tournaments a couple times a year. And believe it or not, I've played against, in South Florida, against some, you know, the, you know, the pros, people you see. Yeah, yeah. And I made it three years ago with all these lunatics who play every week. I made it to the final table. I was a chip leader on TV with people that won $80 million. And I finished fourth and won, you know, whatever, a couple hundred thousand dollars. But the point being is, you realize everybody needs an outlet, you know? And so to me, whether it's, you know, working out, physically, mentally, doing something that may be in a healthy way, going ahead and having an outlet. So when I, when I go to Vegas, you know, you know, net net, I think I'm down a little money over the whole time, but I'm lucky because, you know, but I'm looking to win the entire casino, right? I'm not looking to win that. And, and you, it's not going to happen. But that allows me the release to go back and come back to reality and say, okay, we just got stopped that. this corn story being spread. We just got stopped that. And that gas, we got stopped that, stopped that, stopped that. You know, the idea for the people who are investing, and more for trading is you have to be like a really like a prize fighter, right? You have to be able to take punches, take punches, take punches, you know, take the jabs, but never take the knockout punch. And if you can survive the jabs and not the knockout punch, you're going to be successful. That's that's perfect. I think that's just a perfect ending.